Okay, take two. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. And I'd like to start off by acknowledging my colleagues and fellow members of the committee. Thank you, Diana Ayala, for being here. So today we'll hear from representatives of health and hospitals and members of the public about access to specialty care services at health and hospitals. H&H &H provides a range of comprehensive specialty care services, including but not limited to care for those with asthma, cancer, geriatric needs, sickle cell, mental health needs, and HIV and AIDS, and the list goes on. Although H&H &H offers comprehensive specialty care services, accessing these services in a timely fashion is sometimes challenging. According to Dr. Katz, for example, in testimony before this committee in February 2018, a person could wait up to six months to receive an appointment for specialty care services at health and hospitals. I know that Dr. Katz and H&H &H have been working hard to lower wait times and improve access to these services, and I'm looking forward to hearing about the progress that has been made and the challenges that still exist to ensure that patients have access to the specialty care they need within a reasonable amount of time. Now, the availability of appointments is not the only way to measure access to care. As was highlighted in a hearing this committee held in November of last year on access to transgender and gender non-conforming friendly health services, many TGNC and B individuals do not seek needed health care services due to fear of being mistreated by their health care provider. Individuals with disabilities, despite federal, state, and local laws requiring equal access to health care services, still faced physical accessibility challenges in accessing care according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And finally, studies have shown that individuals with limited English proficiency may face increased barriers to accessing health care. Today, I want to hear from members of the public regarding any challenges they faced in accessing specialty care services at h, &H. It is critical to ensure that specialty care is accessible to all New Yorkers, and I'm looking forward to hearing about the policies and strategies H&H &H has in place to achieve this goal. And to start, I'd like to invite Health and Hospitals, Mitchell Katz, uh, Dave Chokshi, okay. Matt Siegler, okay. I hope I pronounced everyone's name correctly. Feel free to uh, let me know. What well, we want to administer the oath. Uh, we trust you, but we have to do it. Can you state your name for the record, please? And um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Sorry, uh, I have to start up. Is it a, as you know, I'm a primary care doctor and I'm a strong believer in the value of primary care for keeping patients healthy. We've made great progress on access to primary care uh, and patients can now see a primary care provider in our system within one to two weeks, uh, allowing that some patients may, may wait longer if they wish to see a particular doctor in a particular clinic. But much as I believe in primary care, uh, sometimes my patients need specialty care. Uh, they may have severe congestive heart failure, need to see a cardiologist or a broken bone, and need to see an orthopedist. Uh, in serious cases, health and hospitals can ensure immediate access to specialty care. I can call right from my clinic, I can reach a consultant, I can send someone to the emergency room, I can send someone to a clinic. If I have a patient, for example, who comes with an acute loss of vision, I'm going to get them seen that day because that's what they need. Um, but when it's less than an emergency, I think that's where what you had said, Chairwoman Rivera, can be an issue, is where people might wait longer 
uh, for something that's very important but isn't an emergency, such as a persistent gastrointestinal reflux, which is causing them bad heartburn or severely arthritic joint that perhaps needs replacement. Part of the challenge is that reimbursement for uninsured persons needing outpatient specialty care is very limited. And therefore, a person without insurance in New York has few options for where they can receive specialty care at an affordable price. This is different if you think about it from emergency care or inpatient care, where all of the hospitals in the city participate both because of the EMTALA responsibility, that they cannot deny care due to inability to pay, as well as the state shares disproportionate share hospital dollars for people to be in the hospital. Also in the area of primary care, New York City has some wonderful federally qualified health centers that are able to provide great primary care. And they get an enhanced rate on Medicaid as well as federal dollars. But in this particular niche of outpatient specialty care, there is really no state or federal reimbursement for the care of the uninsured. And so that's why people rely very heavily on health and hospitals and also why it can be challenging uh, for us to have enough services. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we uh, offer outstanding specialty care regardless of whether or not people have insurance. That's the greatness of health and hospitals. But it also means that if we're the only one who's really providing that service, having sufficient access um, can be difficult. Like many things in a large system such as ours, there's a lot of variation in the wait times, which I think leads to a certain amount of confusion about, well, how long do you have to wait? Uh, someone can go to a particular clinic and be told, well, it's three months, um, and our system isn't always sophisticated enough to know, well, actually, if they went to that other hospital for, at h and it would only be two weeks. We're not yet at that uh, level of uh, competency, but we're going to get there, as I'll explain uh, soon. So the, the most important initiative and why I wanted to have Dr. Chotsky here with me is electronic consultation. So electronic consultation allows a primary care doctor like me to put in a consult to rheumatology, to cardiology, to orthopedics, and get back an answer for my patient. Often that answer is something that I can do myself as a primary care doctor. So in the case of congestive heart failure, it might be that the patient needs a new medicine um, that would make their breathing easier. The cardiologist can tell me that. The person doesn't need to wait um, for a visit. They can simply tell me uh, what it is that I should be doing. Um, the, if the patient does need to be seen, then now we have a, a system to be able to make that happen. Uh, today, eConsult is live in over 100 clinics across 10 facilities, uh, including adult medical and surgical subspecialties, behavioral health and pediatric subspecialties. Nearly 8,000 referrals per month are managed, which is up from just 2,300 uh, in January 2018. And I think this is one of the reasons, uh, Chair Rivera, that we have made progress, and I'm happy to say that we no longer have six-month waits, but some, some of our outliers are still as much as three months, so there's still, there's still progress to be made. For a set of 14 specialty clinics using eConsult for over a year, we saw a 23% reduction in overall wait times. Um, second, to make the system better, we need to improve our scheduling systems and our referral practices. Um, making sure that each appointment is the right length of time and that we can send people from the emergency department to a real appointment rather than telling them in the emergency department, okay, well, orthopedic clinic starts at 9 o'clock on Tuesday. Well, if they just go to orthopedic clinic without an appointment 9 o'clock on Tuesday, they're going to wind up waiting because there's already somebody with a 9 o'clock appointment on Tuesday. Um, 
Third, we need to invest in new clinical services and providers to help us meet the demand for specialty care. We've recently approved business plans to grow HIV care, gastrointestinal care, cardiac care. Uh, I want to address our waiting times by making smart investments wherever we can. I also want to acknowledge publicly that while we're doing a lot to improve specialty care, there are some amazing things at health and hospitals. And one of the ones that, that I think is so amazing is that Metropolitan Hospital provides gender-affirming uh, surgeries to transgender and non-conforming patients. And it, to my knowledge, there's no other public hospital in all of the U.S. who does that, and that includes San Francisco, uh, where I originally was director. So, I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, our behavioral health services, very advanced, very specialized. Uh, New York City, in part because of the tragedy of the AIDS epidemic, was a leader in many HIV areas. Uh, I think that we do well in the care of the disabled, although I think there's a lot more that we can do around our equipment. Uh, and with that, I, I look forward to any questions and telling you more about our system. Thank you. Thank you. So um, you mentioned a, a few things I, I just wanted to get a little bit more detail on. You said that the person, the average person doesn't have to wait six months anymore for an appointment, but on average, how long does it take for a patient uh, to see a specialist? Okay, so in fact, I have, I brought my table, because I knew you would be smart enough to ask that question. So there is both the average and the range. Um, and um, uh, I, I'll go through and tell you um, what it is in each specialty. It's not that long a list. Uh, and at some point, you could say, I've, I got the idea, Mitch, if you, if you so wish. So cardiology. The shortest wait time in our system, two days. Longest wait time in our system, 38 days. But North Central Bronx is an outlier with three months. Um, endocrine, shortest wait time is at Lincoln. Uh, longest wait time, Jacoby, three months. Gastrointestinal, shortest wait time, Harlem, one day. Jacoby, 10 weeks. And I'd say Jacoby is an outlier, and having to prepare this data for you was really helpful because it, it tells me I need to do more about specialty access at Jacoby because it turned into the longest wait time. Renal, uh, Lincoln, 17 days. Jacoby, three months. Neurology, Lincoln, one day. Bellevue, 34 days. Uh, Jacoby was an outlier at three months. Ophthalmology, um, five days was the shortest. Jacoby, again, the longest, three months. Podiatry, Belvis, one day. Harlem, three months. And this is a good time to stop and that's say. A pretty, that's pretty, okay. Did you okay. want to stop and, and say something? And I won't read the yes, but, but it's a good place to end and say, interesting, it also shows you the heterogeneity. Because Be Harlem, which is the fastest for cardiology and GI, is the longest for podiatry. And I think that tells you just another thing about our system, which is that it's heterogeneity. It's heterogeneity. Uh, it isn't the same in every place. And when we have the ability through EPIC to really, instead of saying to a person who comes to Jacoby, I'm sorry, it's three months, saying, if you go to Harlem, and specialty, unlike primary care, sometimes just one visit, we could get you in tomorrow. And that's part of how I see us improving the system. I, mean, I think that's interesting because I, I wondered how related some of the specialty care services are to demographics. You know, when you, when you look at specifically communities of color and some of the issues that they're facing, I know that in black and brown communities, diabetes is a very, very serious um, issue. And so I always think of people who are suffering from diabetes and podiatry and all of these things are very related because of some of the symptoms and, and that they could suffer. So I guess in, in, I'd love to maybe chat with you 
another time about the demographics relating to the hospital and the services that you offer at each facility. But, 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 but before that, I want to ask, um, so it sounds like you have a number of specialty care services that you provide. Are there any services that H&H &H currently does not provide? We do not do bone marrow transplant. We do not do renal transplant. We do not do uh, liver or cardiac or pancreatic transplant. Um, we do not treat some what, uh, of the leukemias. Do you refer uh, them so to we another refer, hospital? refer, absolutely. But we do not do those on our own. Dr. Chesky, is there anything else we don't do? Um, no, I wouldn't add anything to the list. Uh, I would just emphasize, you know, particularly with our academic partnerships, um, it allows us to, uh, to make referrals to other quaternary academic medical centers where those services can be provided. And so I know you also mentioned in your testimony about outpatient revenue stream, and of course reimbursement is always an issue. Is the services that you uh, provide directly related to the type of insurance that you take? Well, we, we are, I'm very proud, we're uh, agnostic at the level of the provider, right? So we'll, the providers have no idea what people have. But you, t you take all insurance? We or? don't take all insurances because some of the insurances won't pay us a fair rate. Um, so uh, uh, Matt Siegler, who's here, does our negotiation. Uh, and, and we've brought to you this issue uh, and, uh, you know, I don't see any reason I can't speak openly. I, I joined Emblem as a city employee uh, because I wanted an insurance that would let me be seen at health and hospitals, where I wanted to be primary, but that would cover my children who are still in California till June. Hmm. So I couldn't join Metro Plus. Uh, for a new primary care appointment, I see this on my statement, they paid us $41. And I can tell from my statements that when I was in California and had the bicycle accident, they were paying the California hospital significantly higher rates, right? And so, you know, yes, it, theoretically, we would want to take all insurance, but if they're, I mean, I don't think that anybody can break even for a primary care appointment at $41. That's a new appointment. Um, that's an old contract and Matt is working on renegotiating it. But um, the insurance can't be taking advantage. That's not fair. City subsidy is meant for the uninsured. It's not meant to subsidize insurance companies. So there are some insurance companies that just won't pay us fair rates at all. Do your H and H facilities accept the same insurance? Like every single facility accepts accepts the same insurance? Uh, predominantly, do some of our skilled nursing facilities? There are unique contracts that do or do not cover post acute care. But yes, across the system, we contract as one entity. Are there are there any patients that you have to turn away because of the the insurance that they have? No, we treat everybody regardless of their ability to pay. Um, you know, if people are coming in for elective care and we don't take their insurance, we will advise them to go to a participating provider because the bill is potentially higher if you're seeing an out-of-network provider, but we never turn anybody away. So there is a chance that a person receiving primary care at H&H &H cannot receive specialty care because the specialists won't accept their health insurance? Uh, anyone that we, all of our insurance contracts cover both primary and specialty care. So, uh, I, but I think, I think to, to the, and you know, this is the horrible world of perverse incentives. I think there are people who it wouldn't be smart financially for them to get their care with us because we would be out of network for them. And so, so a, if we were more uh, money grubbing, we might say, yes, join us. But we, I mean, if we see somebody and we know that if they go to us, they're going to get a big out of network bill we'll tell them we don't, we, and it is a true state, I mean, it, it, some is the vocabulary. It, if you're out of network, it's kind of a true statement that we don't take your insurance. We're out of network. Um, generally, it's better to say we're out of network, but I think sometimes as a shorthand, people say we don't take your insurance. 
So you gave me a, a very good table of uh, some of the specialty care services at every facility and on average with the wait times. And I know that some of them are as long as 90 days. Um, I don't think I heard anything longer than that. At the current time, nothing is longer than 90 days. Do so, and I, I clearly wait times vary based on specialty. Is there a difference in how long a, a, a former patient versus or a current patient versus a new patient waits? No, I don't think so. Um, in brief, uh, no, there's not a significant difference between a new patient appointment or um, a revisit appointment. Uh, there, you know, are always certain clinical circumstances that will create, you know, exigencies where uh, a new patient may need to be seen more quickly. And, um, you know, we both have mechanisms in place to try to account for that and are building uh, further mechanisms in large part, you know, through e-consult so that uh, when someone does need to be seen urgently, there's a way to expedite um, an appointment. And just because of the nature of some clinical problems, that is more often the case for a new appointment than a revisit appointment. And, and I'll ask you about e-consults in a second, but if a patient doesn't have insurance and there is a specialty care service that you don't provide, what happens when you refer them? They would get emergency Medicaid, but it can be an issue. Um, I mean, you, uh, again, I'll, let me defer, Dr. Chatsky, you've been in the system longer. It's, it can be an issue. Um, in, in certain cases, yes, it can be uh, an issue. Um, you know, we'll strive in a case-by-case -case basis, you know, to make sure that people who um, need care, we figure out a way to deliver the care, um, and then we figure out a way to, um, you know, have the finances uh, work around what a, a given patient needs. It has to be individualized based on the person and why it, I mean, in general, I mean, if you ask sort of the, the state, what they'd say is that they should qualify for state um, emergency Medicaid in that circumstance. If they so urgently need a service and the only services that we don't provide are the, the kinds of things that constitute emergencies, like you need a new kidney. Um, but as Dr. Chatsky is also saying, it isn't so easy to arrange and it requires a physician to get on the telephone and the nonprofit hospitals do have an obligation as nonprofits to provide charity care. And so we look to, you know, sometimes based on neighborhood, sometimes at the hospital, what affiliations the hospital has. Harlem has an affiliation with Columbia, which is different than Bellevue has a affiliation with NYU, we'll, we'll try to work the affiliations, um, a, uh, the Sloan Kettering will take a patient um, with cancer that's serious, and we try to, but it's at that level that you have to do it. No, the, the patient, nav the whole navigating the system I know can be incredibly intimidating, and for someone who is undocumented, I mentioned limited English proficiency. Um, you know, I, I, I can imagine that it's very stressful. So besides those people that are helping someone navigate a system, and I know you have a number of navigators, social workers, um, you know, people specifically helping some of your geriatric patients, are you hiring new specialists to meet the demand? We are. We are. And, and y this hearing and just in general, uh, our looking at this is helpful, right? Because it you, we want to hire what we need, where we need it, and it isn't always the same for hospitals. So, so trying to, obviously what you want is you want supply to equal demand. Uh, it's not that each hospital needs three urologists. One may need two and one may need five based on volume and, and as you were talking about, patient demographics. So now that we've, uh, with our e-consult, uh, and eliminating the really long six-month ones, we're going to work on what are the additional specialties we are. And again, it, it's quite like I was involved with getting a one gastroenterologist to Elmhurst because that was an area where they had unrealistically long wait times. Um, because patients only are seen by specialists once or twice, unlike primary care, one person can make a huge difference in your wait times. And sometimes the wait times happen because we have two 
and somebody retires. Um, so it's, it's, it's like microclimates. That's why we have to do a better job of at least, I mean, we're not going to send the NCD patient to Coney Island, but, you know, in areas like Jacoby, Harlem, um, Met, um, Lincoln, right, in those kinds of areas, we need, because we'll do the transportation. It's a lot easier for me to transport somebody than it is to come up with a specialist, right? If I already have a urologist, and again, urology is a good example, you don't generally need to see them over and over again one visit, send them, then I'd rather pay for the transportation um, and get them to their appointment. So I, I want to recognize council members uh, Moya and Eugene, and you have a question, okay. Um, so I'm actually going to, council member Eugene, if you're ready to ask your question, I'm willing to turn the floor over to you if you're ready to ask your question. If you'd like. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. As a matter of fact, I got two very important public units at the same time, hospital and health, and they are connected. Uh, so my question is, we know there's a health disparity in the community in New York City, depending on where you live, which hospital you go to, this is a reality. And we know also that uh, there is a, a different type of resources or ability to hire the best doctors, depending, you know, in uh, which hospital we're talking to. Because uh, I know that the hospital, they are trying, certain hospital, they are trying to hire the best specialist, the best specialist, because they have the resources to do that. If they got the best specialists and also they have the enough resources, they would be, quote unquote, able to provide a higher quality of FK, higher, better than the public, you know, hospital. My question is, what do you have in place, what we have in place to ensure that the public hospital, you know, can hire also great specialists, doctors with the same quality of expertise, and other for you to provide the best quality of FK to the patient? Well, thank you, Council Member, for raising that. And, and, you know, it's absolutely my commitment that, that people should be seen by the best doctors possible, regardless of their income, regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of geographically where they live. And, and as you know better than anyone, uh, even within similar economic pockets, the, there are differences by ethnicity in terms of what people need. The, the Afro-Caribbean community around Kings County is different than the West African community that's around Harlem. Uh, and we need to address both and we need to do both well. Uh, getting the data really helps me in understanding what our needs are and we're going to do our very best to, to hire the highest quality clinicians. Uh, also, uh, the academic affiliations in the case of Kings uh, with SUNY is helpful in getting the best doctors because many of the best doctors want to maintain an academic affiliation and a teaching role. Thank you very much. You're talking about Kings County, which is in my district, a wonderful institution, you know, providing good quality of care to people from New York. And as a matter of fact, they are a trauma center also, which is very, very important. But I think that, you know, they have uh, challenges also in terms of resources. So uh, we know that hospital they are competing competing for best quality of doctors best uh, technology and we know that uh, the resources is really fundamental for hospital to hire best physician best expert what can we do we in the city council to work together with the public hospital to ensure that you have what it takes to put you in the position to compete and to hire the best uh, physician and to acquire the best uh, technology possible to provide the best uh, quality of health care to our constituents. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to work with all of you and uh, I would say, you know, we promoted uh, Dr. Donnie Bell um, who was, who, who continues to see patients as a neuroradiologist at King's, phenomenal physician, graduate of Howard and uh, had, did his residency at Harvard, 
Um, and you know, my commitment to you is to continue to work for getting the very best physicians throughout our system. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have been very gracious. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Council Member Ayala. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so my questions are obviously um, around the accessibility uh, for individuals with uh, disabilities. Um, it's something that you know we've discussed in my committee uh, several times and that um, I'm pretty curious about because I know that some of the, well, many of the HHC or HNH facilities are pretty outdated and I wonder where we are in terms of retrofitting uh, these facilities, if any of them have in fact been retrofitted um, to date uh, to accommodate or to better accommodate uh, individuals with disabilities. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for your work in this area. I mean, H and H, other institutions need to go so much further on disability access. And uh, just to mention what I, uh, a sort of what I'd say a humorous story, when I was uh, just back after being hit by uh, a car, I went to take care of my patients. Matt Gouvenier, I need to use the restroom. Happily, Gouvenier has a, a really nice disability restroom. Go in with my wheelchair door is wide, s toilet has the bar, sink is, is low. I go to get a towel, I can't reach it because mm. nobody has thought of the person in the wheelchair trying to get a towel, right? And so I'm there with like my wet hands trying to, you know, manipulate the thing and using my shirt to dry someone. And I thought it was a fascinating example even though it's incredibly trivial because it costs nothing to lower the towel rack. Right. Yeah. No money at all. All it requires is that you think of the world from the point of view of somebody who has a disability. And clearly, in our placement of that towel uh, rack, we weren't thinking of it. Um, the council has helped us. Um, it, while it's true that the facilities, our facilities are older, most of the need is around types of appropriate tables uh, so, for example, if a woman needs a pap smear um, and she uh, is a quadriplegic, uh, making sure that the table is appropriate, uh, it's the bathrooms. Generally, it's not the doors. Generally, it's not the doors and the ramps. That was early ADA. Um, but it's really the bathrooms, the examining table. Uh, we have received uh, funds for it, and each of the projects is on schedule, but I would say that we have um, a ways to go. Uh, uh, Sydenham is 95% complete. Marsania is 85% complete. Um, Cumberland is in design phase. Uh, Woodhall radiology for mammograms was completed in 2018. So I just say I'm very committed to this issue. I appreciate your advocacy. There's a lot more that could be done. I, you know, I just, I, f I, I find it really frustrating, and this is not an H and H thing, but it's just basic, you know, um, human rights needs. Um, I, 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 for example, have my my uh, my father who's disabled. He's dis he's uh, obese, and I, you know, remember taking him to the hospital. I won't mention the hospital; it was a private hospital, and him being very uncomfortable. He had a strangulated hernia at the time and was in a lot of pain for well over 12 hours because they couldn't figure out. If it in f what in fact, you know, if, if in fact it was a strangulated hernia because he needed to have an MRI. Um, the fact that he was, you know, obese didn't allow him to use the MRI that was available in the hospital, right? So they require uh, the use of an open MRI, which then uh, merited him having to be moved to a different hospital, which was further away from home, where they did provide that service and he was able to have surgery that night and where it was pretty evident from the moment that he got there that, they, these, that this hospital specialized on individuals with uh, obesity-related um, you know, medical uh, care needs. And so I, had I not, like you, experienced it firsthand, I would never have known. Um, but it was uh, very frustrating to watch someone that you love not only have to go through that level of extreme pain um, because the medical equipment was not available, but the imposition that placing or having to remove a patient from their local hospital to an outer, you know, district hospital where now fam visiting, visiting becomes a problem. I don't know when was the last time you were hospitalized, but the last time I was in the hospital, I, I was going 
insane. Um, you know, I, my, my mental health was declining. It's this, this very, uh, you know, uh, debilitating just to be there. And so the, the support network, right, uh, is important. And so by removing people from their communities and putting them in hospitals because we don't have access to the appropriate medical equipment um, is mind boggling. So I wonder, is that something that H&H &H hospitals um, is also looking into the uh, the open MRIs for not only this, not only people with uh, obesity, but you know an individual that may be unable to use a regular MRI machine. It's a good point. Uh, I, I have a patient uh, who, because of developmental disability, needed an MRI and couldn't withstand the closed one, and I did have to send her out. Mm -hmm. I mean, in her case, it was to an outpa it was an outpatient procedure, so it wasn't the tragedy for your father, but no, at the current time, we do not have anywhere in H&H &H an open MRI. Um, MRIs are very expensive, as you know. Um, I think that, the, but the big point that I take from your testimony is, the problem is in the system, not the person with the disability. That's right. It's not their problem, That's it's right. our problem. We are failing to meet their needs um, and everything from the towel rack to the open MRI should be provided. Um, and That's it's right. just a question of, you know, uh, and what speed can we get there? So, the, so, so that brings me to my, my next question. Is, is there within the H&H &H portfolio a, a person who is tasked with helping uh, design for individuals with disabilities in the hospitals, like a, a, you know, a coordinator of sorts? Other agencies have them. I wonder if H and H has somebody on staff. We do, we do, uh, and and I uh, I I think that's totally important. Uh, again, just to divert it, how common these. I built an outpatient center in Los Angeles, um, and one of the things that turned out to be wrong with it is that the ramp was too steep. So the ramp, which was a hundred percent compliant with ADA which is what the builders said when I complained. They said, well, it's 100% compliant. But it turns out that a ramp compliant with ADA is based on the idea someone's going to push you, mm. not that you're going to self-propel. But of course, we're supposed, we should be encouraging people to be as independent as possible. So we had to retrofit the ramp to allow. My point being that you're right, that you, it's an expert. Just because you get the ramp fits the ADA doesn't make it acceptable, it may make it legally acceptable, exactly. but it doesn't mean that it fulfills the spirit of the ADA, which is to allow people independence. Um, so uh, we'll keep working on it and appreciate your involvement. I mean, anything that I can do to kind of help expedite it, because I, well, I appreciate, you know, the understanding of why we need to be where we need to be um, to, to be more accessible to individuals with disabilities. I expect a level of expediency that I don't really necessarily see in government, and I'm not, again, this is not a, a Dr. That. Katz issue, um, but I think that when we talk about individuals with disabilities and the elderly, for some reason, there isn't this lack of you know, urgency in getting things done. Do you, do you by any chance happen to know how many, how many people with disabilities are referred out of the H&H uh, portfolio because of an inability to provide services or an inaccessibility of? I don't. I, I mean, the big one that comes all the time is the open MRI. I mean, that's how I learned, because as a provider, I said, I have a patient who needs an open MRI. What do I do? And someone brought me the form and said, you, you send them to this place. Um, Which makes no sense, because we're in the middle of an obesity epidemic, right? right. And we don't have a way to treat individuals with obesity and public and private hospitals for the most part. I'd be happy Isn't to go sad? back. I don't know what the cost of an open MRI is, uh, but I, I mean, you can, we have space because they put them in trailers these days. So it's entirely, you don't have to, it's not like the old days where you had to like build the, the special room. So now they can do them in trailers and we have land, uh, but I can't answer the question of what uh, I'll ask, I'll ask Matt to, to put that on our list of business plans is what would it cost um, to to have one? Yeah, that would be really important. Um, and just uh, just a point of clarity, you mentioned the exam tables for women who are go coming in for gynecological exams. Are those already up to code? So uh, we have. They are in some, but not every place yet. So how does a woman coming in for a gynecological exam now 
today at a hospital that's we not would, equipped. We would issues. recommend that a, and it is true that as a primary care doctor, I don't usually do a GYN exam on the same visit as my first visit. So what I would do at the current time, which is not ideal, is I would send, and we do have in, in all of the boroughs, at least one site that has the appropriate tables. So I would send her to go to see a GYN doctor at one of those sites. But I would agree that that's not what's right. But there has to be a transition from nothing to what's right. But then it further exacerbates the wait time, right? So if I'm coming in presenting with issues, and now I have to wait to, you know. It could, it could, but you, would, you wouldn't generally do it on I just out of curiosity, why wouldn't you give a, gyne a gynecological exam on the first visit? I'm not saying you never would. Um, I say this just as a primary care provider that usually, well, I would say if the woman's complaint was vaginitis, but if the woman's complaint is, which is the typical primary care, I'm here for a physical, usually because of the setup, it's visit two. And also most of us ask, uh, because it becomes a cultural issue, some people want uh, some women want their GYN exam done by a gynecologist, not by a primary care doctor. Okay. Um, so we, it's usually a second visit issue, but not if that's their pro not if that's their complaint. Yeah, no, that I, would just, be I, I would hope that a gynecologist would be able to perform an exam on the on the day that I show up and not have. If to you went to, a, I, I was saying, if you, if yeah. you went, if your first visit was to a primary care doctor. Yes. But yes, if you set an appointment, no, I, I asked because you mentioned that you, know, you wouldn't you wouldn't personally do it. Right, as a primary care doctor, I'd do it on the second visit, unless the complaint was a a vaginal complaint or a pelvic complaint. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Councilmember Mazel, uh, Councilmember Moya. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for being here. I, I just uh, I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, when you were going over the specialty uh, care that is uh, being provided throughout H&H, &H, was uh, uh, cancer mentioned in that at all, or? Uh, not on the wait times list, but we do provide cancer services at Grand Rapids. Okay, well, the reason why I ask is, um, you know, luckily, you know, uh, uh, Elmhurst just went through their kind of legislative priorities, and uh, this was last week, but, when we're seeing uh, a lot of sort of the uh, cancer rates uh, increase, especially in immigrant communities, um, when they were defined as where the clusters really come in from, where it's uh, uh, people from Asia, South and Central America, uh, different parts of, of, of Africa, you know, that's the base of the majority of uh, patient population in, in most of these H&H uh, &H facilities. So the reason why I was asking is that since there's, they, they, they've been seeing a, an increase and, and most of the time the patients that, that uh, come into uh, an H&H &H facility, it's almost when they're, they're terminal, right? Um, it's because I, I know that you're doing a lot to uh, really start providing the uh, care that's outside of the facilities. Uh, but just my question was, has this, is this something that is uh, you've seen uh, throughout the H and H system where there's more uh, immigrant uh, communities coming in with uh, high indices of cancer rates. I think in general, cancer rates are up, sir, as just as you're saying. Um, and I'm not, I can't answer whether they're up higher in immigrant versus born here because they're up. I know they're up across the board. Um, I think that it's changes in how people are eating, changes in the environment, uh, and maybe a little bit that people are living longer. And cancer is a disease that, whose incidence grows as you age. Uh, so I think the combination of environment plus older is resulting in general more, more cancer. Um, and it, it also is a challenge uh, when someone gets a cancer diagnosis, of course, they want to know, right, they want to be seen by the oncologist right away, as any of us would, Correct. just to understand prognosis. Right. So even if the treatment doesn't need to be that day, for psychological reasons, you want to try to get them in that day. And, and so but you're saying that there hasn't been an increase in wait time for? I don't think that there, that there has been an increase in wait time. I do think... Uh, several of our facilities, including Elmhurst, 
and Bellevue are particularly good at cancer care, uh, have yes. you know, very advanced levels of care, but like everything else, there's room for improvement. Right. Um, and uh, cancer care is another one where there's not uh, uniformity in opinion in the field of medicine to the extent to which you should go specialization versus generalist. Yeah. Um, you know, should you, you know, should you, there are, there are people who would say a system like ours should have like two cancer centers and everybody should go to them because that's how you get the sub, sub, sub specialty, which increasingly cancer care requires. On the other hand, you know, then people have to travel and cancer visits are not usually one visit. Right, it's not like going to the urologist, right? Usually people, especially if they need chemo, are gonna need multiple ones. So that's where we say, well, then we, we wanna try to have it in multiple places. But again, it can be, cancer can be so specific. Uh, increasingly, oncologists are doing one type of cancer. Again, very different than when I trained, right? right? Where, so, you know, so now, you know, e even specialty times can be affected like, okay, you have a great GI cancer person, but you don't have a great breast, or vice versa, at one place. And, you know, do you move the person? Do you move the doctor? It's not so easy. Right. Yeah, well, that's what I was trying to get at. It's, it's you know, how, how are we examining this, you know, holistically as an entire H&H &H system, given what you've just outlined? But to add to that, and this is my last question, Madam Chair, it, given that it's a high immigrant communities that are there, are there specific um, materials that have been made uh, to give in the different languages? I mean, I know Elmhurst has all of that in, and they do a great job, but I'm just saying a, as a whole, is there uh, the materials, translators, because you know, obviously sure. uh, cancer is a, is sure. a, a Well, place. I can say uh, without question that New York City not that it's perfect, does a better job with translation than either of the two public systems I previously worked for. And that nothing because of my efforts, that was here. I mean, I think New York City just does better. More, again, not perfect, Nothing's, nothing in life is perfect, uh, but, but more translators, more materials correctly translated, more, uh, uh, more materials, more languages, um, I think that, that language is one of the things that Health and Hospitals does quite well. And again, nothing because of my efforts. Got it. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to acknowledge Council Member Reynoso. Uh, thanks for being here. So I wanted to just, uh, just follow up on Council Member Moya's question. How many H&H &H doctors speak a language other than English and how many staff? Well, I do. Well, I know uh, you but speak I don't Spanish. know how many be do. Everywhere. Do we know? I, I don't know that number off the top of my head. No, I, I personally do as well, and I practice, but um, but I'm not sure what the overall number is. We do, uh, and and uh, again to relate to this, uh, we so again at Gouverneur, third of the pe patients who come to me speak English, third speak Spanish, and I can do. Third, speak Mandarin, and I can't really do more than hello. But super good phone translation services, always instantly there, never wait more than 15 seconds, very competent. You know, my patients like it. Um, I've never had a medical issue where they didn't, where they couldn't do it. Um, and we, we have that for all languages everywhere. Um, so, I mean, I think culturally, one of the things I love about health and hospitals is a lot of our uh, physicians are from the community. One of the, the coolest examples is at Harlem, we have a brother and sister who are from West Africa. Both of them are OBGYN, practicing at Harlem with this, this conclave of West Africans. Um, and it's beautiful, right? I mean, it's everything you would want in culturally competent care. Uh, it isn't always so great, right? And we do have mismatches, um, but pretty good, I think, compared to other public systems. 
So there aren't always interpreters available, and I know in Councilmember Moyesich Elm, well, Elmhurst, there's over 100 languages spoken inside right. that facility. But you always, you feel like at least the phone system is consistently ready and, and can go in 15 seconds. Consistently. And, and I'll also tell you, in, uh, before I worked for a high functioning with phone system, I wouldn't have said this, in many ways, um, it's preferable to have phone than in-person translators um, because it allows you more the typical doctor-patient relationship. The patient looks at you instead of the person you look at them. And, and it's like in the background, it's like reading subtitles. After a while, you forget that you're not understanding their Mandarin and they're not understanding you. Where we really value in-person translators are for tough hospital issues like end-of-life discussions, mm. right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have an end-of-life discussion ideally with a phone translator, right? There are certain, you know, very serious issues where that has to be done in person. Um, but again, compared to other public systems I've worked in, the access is better here. When you're giving a patient news for example, if, if, they, if they need to come in for treatment for some sort of cancer, I understand that's multiple visits. But let's say if someone comes in and they aren't able to be seen at that facility because of your capacity. You aren't able to serve someone who is obese for a certain MRI or whatever service it is. And let's say you, you refer them to another facility. Do you charge them for two visits? If all you did was refer, no. Often, though, like in the example, you may see somebody once. Like when, I, so when in the, the specific, when I saw someone who needed a open MRI, she had a visit with me. I mean, it was all Medicaid, but we we did send bill to Medicaid for my visit, and then she went to the open MRI, and the open MRI sent a, a bill to Medicaid. Um, so it, it depends how, but I understand if you provide no service, <coughs> there should be no bill. If you provide a service, then and then there should be a bill. Right. So that was that was my question. So I, I want to ask about costs and missed appointments. Do you know how many appointments result in patient no shows, and why do you think patients miss their appointments? You want to, I, I don't know that we have an official percentage. Uh, in many cases, it's quite high. Uh, it can be, I know of clinics in our system where it's as high as 40%. Our patients often live lives where they won't get paid if they take off from work, where they uh, may not have transportation, where a kid may get sick or a parent may not be able to be left. Um, they don't necessarily have the kind of jobs that we're lucky enough to have where you tell your supervisor, I have to go for an eye appointment at 2.30, and your supervisor says, good luck, hope that eye appointment goes well. Well, does H&H &H lose revenue with missed appointments? We and does that range do, by specialty we care? We do if we don't overbook. We attempt, and it's a mixed thing, we attempt like the airlines to overbook but get the right number of people. So every clinic should, and this is the same as you would do in the private sector, right? If, you, if the right number of people to see is 10 and you have a 20% no-show rate, you would book 12. And then you wouldn't lose revenue. The problem is if the 20% or whatever your no-show rate is just an average. And that means sometimes everybody's going to come and you, then you have 12 patients, and people are going to wait too long, and the doctor is going to get frustrated. And then at other times, eight people are going to show, and you're going to lose revenue. We are trying, like other systems, and we made a lot of progress of this in LA, calling people the night before, confirming appointments, doing eligibility and pre-authorization. All of those things should happen before the person arrives which will also make their visit much better. Bellevue in particular, historically, people wait a long time, too long for the registration process. That's not right. 
we got up in LA to 90% of people were registered for their visit the night before. And you try to do the reminders in their language of choice. Of course. Right? But and again, that we're good at. The, and so for the EPIC system, which we haven't talked a lot about, is that going to be a feature, that sort of reminder, and also maybe a link if they're, if they're comfortable digitally to start the registration process? Yes. EPIC will help with that. EPIC will also help us to see what the waiting time is in nearby hospitals hmm. so that you can and be able to schedule somebody. A, a major issue uh, that I refer to in my testimony is, let's say somebody comes right now to the emergency room on a Saturday. They need a specialty visit follow-up that week. Well, the specialty clinic isn't open that week, and the emergency room can't see the schedule. That's where they then give them the appointment that isn't really an appointment. And they just say, go to orthopedic clinic at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. And that then leads to really long wait times. Under the EPIC system, we'll actually be able to see the, the clerk at the ED will be able to see what the schedule is in orthopedic clinic and put the person into a real appointment instead of telling them to come at 9 o'clock. Um, and that will be a huge boon. Last week, we uh, sat down with a, a number of people from H&H, &H and we discussed the new facilities that are going to be opening up, brand new, tens of thousands of square feet. They sound like they're going to be amazing. Um, are, are those going to help address the specialty care and wait times? Yes, because uh, we envision them as one-stop shops so that we're going to have more services than your standard primary care, uh, and that will make a difference. So especially things that go really well with primary care uh, ophthalmology, a very high number of people who need eye appointments, including all diabetics yearly, podiatry, dental. Um, so those things, absolutely. So are, does H&H &H plan to open more new facilities to address specialty care needs? Well, I think we'd open up f new facilities for the mix of primary and specialty, not, not just for specialty. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, I don't want to oversell that um, space is not our major limitation for specialty. It's, it's really the doctor in the right place and these, these microclimates of things used to be great because you had two and now one has left and in that three months till you hire the new one, the wait time gets astronomical and nobody knows how to move the person to the other clinics. So I, I am trying and I think we're making some progress to get uh, health and hospitals to see itself as a system to help one another. So a patient you know, needs an appointment and your facility doesn't have it, send them to another facility. So in my testimony, I mentioned that we had a joint committee hearing with health about TGNC NB New Yorkers. And so just really briefly, is there any update on, on, from that hearing in terms of, you mentioned, you mentioned Metropolitan Hospital, which is a great program. Are there any plans to, I guess, expand those services or, or kind of replicate them in other facilities? So, yes, I mean, I don't have a detailed um, uh, information, but it's, it's certainly a need that people value. We do, we certify our providers on transgender care. We have a really good online um, uh, modules, which I've taken and gotten certified. We have a number of providers who are competent to prescribe hormone treatment. Um, and it's an area where I think H&H &H does well, but there's more to do, more that could be done. And I know that uh, you have, will likely have a hearing to focus on EPIC and the rollout, and I know that you're doing a tremendous amount of work to consolidate this, that system and how it's working in silos and individual facilities, and so that should be exciting. Um, a quick question on e-consult. Is H&H tracking patient satisfaction in regards to the use of e-consults? Um, we, we are. Um, we've started by uh, doing some um, 
uh, some surveys of uh, patients, you know, related to the normal um, patient satisfaction surveys that, uh, that we do for all uh, health and hospitals patients. And um, we're also collaborating with some external partners um, who uh, have experience uh, in the academic setting uh, to do a more formal rigorous evaluation that will capture uh, patient satisfaction, provider satisfaction, as well as you know, some of the measures that we've talked about in terms of reducing wait times. Have you seen an increase in, in patients since NYC CARE was announced by any chance? I know the rollout's not complete. I'm just curious as to whether people heard that and they kind of... We've gotten some calls, but no. I mean, not a detective. Remember, we're a huge system, so it's hard to, it's hard to see major changes when we see a million patients a year. So, um, I'm, well, I'm going to ask some of the advocates, of course, about of course. Like Epic and uh, about eConsult, excuse me, and about... Um, some of the other issues that we spoke about today. I, I did want to just, of course, thank you for always being here and, and answering our questions to the best of your ability. Um, I think with the, the appointment system and Epic and kind of this, this technology upgrade that I think you all desperately need, um, it will certainly make a difference. And in terms of some of the things that, that my colleague, that Council Member Ayala spoke of in terms of people with disabilities and that access, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want, I think, a clearly smart design, and sometimes it could be one little thing that's short-sighted, so I appreciate you bringing up kind of this recognition that even in something that seems to be right, there is something that is just not thoughtful in terms of people and their limitations. So if there are issues with something like tables, you know, I hope that's something that we can work on together because Great. I realize that the mayor is totally invested in H&H &H in terms of the money, that, that is allocated, but I, I do think there are some things that, that are a little short, and I think that there are certainly things that, that we have funded recently that I would think, I, I would never have thought that an EKG machine would have to, something that we would have to fund. But if that's the case, you have to, please let us know. Thank you. We wanna be helpful. We want every facility to be able to take care of as many New Yorkers as possible, whether it's, you know, regardless of gender or, or you know, limitations. So. Uh, we certainly want to be helpful. Um, and I guess with that, I don't have any further questions. And, and thank you. Thank Thanks you. to all of you. Okay. So I'm going to ask the next panel to please come up. Um, Oliver Gray, Associate Director of DC 37. Are you? Okay, great. Uh, Anne Beauvais from CPHS and Nisna, and Heidi Siegfried from Sydney. And Anthony Feliciano for the Commission on Public Health Systems. Uh, Mr. Feliciano, you have filled out a sheet, correct? Okay, excellent. So, okay, great. Um, is there anyone that would like to begin? Okay, thanks, 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 Anne. Okay, my name is Anne Bovey. I'm on the Board of Directors for NISNA as well as CPHS. And in terms of specialties, um, one of the documents that I passed out uh, just now deals with funding, because most of this is nice to talk about, but if you don't have the dollars behind it, it's not gonna happen. And the indigent care pool as part of the governor's budget really um, is, is you know, instrumental in terms of getting a lot of these services there. And in terms of whatever city council can do to help, that would be greatly appreciated. But in terms of looking at specialty services, I worked as a registered nurse at Bellevue Hospital for 40 years. I just retired about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And one of the things that H&H &H does is it does level one trauma. 
And with level one trauma, you need to have all the specialties. And in order to have all the specialties, you need to have funding behind it to provide all the specialties. But those specialties are there from an emergent framework, not an urgent framework in terms of looking at it from a secondary treatment modality. So subsequently, you know, in terms of availability of resources, in terms of personnel, doctors, nurses, that's where the limitations lie. And you also have to look at how the distribution of services is happening now. For example, at Woodhall Hospital in Brooklyn, a lot of pop-up um, clinics are showing up from the, the different networks, like Northwell, Mount Sinai as examples. And what's happening now is, is that they're basically taking the patients that would have normally gone to Woodhall because of wait time and subsequently are providing services to then transport those individuals for whatever that specialty is that they need. In terms of looking at, for example, Bellevue Hospital, there's also services that are just provided by NYU that, you know, that haven't been really advanced or, you know, built up within Bellevue Hospital, and I could tell you more in, in, in regards to that. But the idea is, is that is H&H &H supplementing the affiliates in terms of them handpicking what patient population would get the best reimbursement for them? I know, for example, at the VA, because I work there on weekends, they, um, there's certain services not provided by the Manhattan VA, and the patients are transferred to NYU for those services. So there's reimbursement that, act, that comes accordingly and is, is definitely there because these individuals are veterans, so subsequently there's money there. Uh, in, in regards to looking at the different specialties available, one of the problems what was brought up about bariatrics in terms of the obesity framework issues that we have in, the, in nationwide right now, a lot has to do with the fact that the end user, the clinician, is not involved and the patient population is not involved in the architecture or the setting up of, um, of, of the building, of the services. So, um, you know, you, what's really needed is the end user to be there, not people in an office. And then you come, I mean, we had new ICUs built at Bellevue about now about 12 years ago, 12, 14 years ago, but when they first opened up, I mean, things like the door couldn't open all the way in the bathroom because it hit the toilet. So then it had to be restructured. You know, stretchers couldn't fit in, in the HIV clinic, so it had to be, you know, reconstructed. You know, and so I think that part of the issue is, is that we need to be looking at the end user. And the reason e EPIC hasn't hit the Veterans Administration is because it's not ADA approved. It doesn't meet the, meet the full criteria. So when you're talking about people that are digital, you know, if you talk about digital registration, you also have to have, make sure that those individuals, first of all, have access to digital registration. You know, do they have access? Is this something that could be an app on a phone? And what percentage of people actually have the ability to have that phone and that app. So in, in regards to looking at um, specialty services and looking at the availability, I think, you know, once again, what was spoken about was the idea of looking at um, the, uh, the demographics of the different areas and seeing, you know, where you have certain entities that need to be focused on and to provide those services in a way that are reasonable and accessible. And what's most important is to have, and it may sound simplistic, but I can't overemphasize it, the idea of having the end user involved. The other thing with EPIC, I, I mean, it, this may be off topic, but I don't think it really is, is EPIC also demands that you use certain companies' equipment so that you have to use a certain infusion pump. You have to use a certain bedside monitor. You have to use a certain, et cetera. I could go down the line. So then, is this a monopoly? You know. And then I also worry about if, if Epic is being used throughout the corporation, 
Most of our affiliates, most of the networks in this area also use that. And is that going to be a tool, if you're gonna look at how long people have to wait for an appointment, are our affiliates going to then use that as a mechanism once again to then you know, take those people that have the insurance? What I worry about is, is that you know, with this present federal administration in terms of public benefits, if those become much restricted and then the resources that we have in H&H &H limited and then those, those patients are no longer being able to see, be seen in the voluntary or private sector, what's gonna be available for them? So I think that in terms of looking in that continuum and holding people accountable and getting real statistics and real data collection is vitally important from a third party and that and that your um, end user needs to be involved. And companies can't, or architectural firms can't dictate what needs to be done. Bellevue's supposed to be a bariatric center. If anybody should have an open MRI, it should be Bellevue. And um, I've been in the system long enough to remember when they didn't have a CAT scan and we had to send people to NYU. So it, it's not acceptable. And I'm not saying that MRIs are cheap, but the cost effectiveness in terms of that capital budget for purchasing that device way outweighs not, not getting it. So I guess that's all I have to say for today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess, how about uh, Mr. Gray? push this button? Oh. Yeah. Okay. First of all, let me say, I think you're my council rep. Where do you live? I live on 14th Street in Stuyvesant Town. Well, oh, I think we spoke about this once. I think I'm on the wrong side of the you're street. All, I wasn't going to say you're on the wrong side. Yeah, if you <laughs> moved across the street, then I'll be your council member. You'll be in great shape. Yeah. Wait, wait, <laughs> wait. Uh -oh. I love Keith Powers, of course. Maybe I'll do that. But uh, I, I remember you were running and you um, uh, came out of the church on the corner in there first and uh, yeah. 14. Yeah. Okay. But anyway. Um, good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, I uh, worked with uh, health and hospitals for six, maybe seven years. I also had the... Uh, experience working here at the council for a number of years. Um, but at any rate, good afternoon, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, touch on a number of areas, but in a more general sense where um, ultimately, if uh, uh, we go much further, we'll be back to uh, testify on legislative initiatives from the council or from um, the union side. Um, what's very important is this, that our union represents 18,000 uh, workers in the H&H um, &H system. I, sometimes I'll slip and call it HHC, but it's H&H. &H. And, um, uh, we recognize that with uh, more than a million visits in uh, all types of facilities that um, uh, there's quite a bit of effort on our part. So there's some issues that are very important to us. We recognize the fact that uh, we handle a significant, if not uh, most, of the uh, indigent care population in the uh, city. Now, what that means is that um, no matter what's said, at the end of the day, if a uh, person can't uh, get their health care somewhere else, um, the H&H uh, the, the, uh, &H becomes the, almost the family uh, physician, which at times is not the best uh, thing in the world. But at any rate, uh, the good thing that I can say is that Generally, we feel that H&H uh, &H is becoming uh, a better system uh, recently. 
Um, there were tremendous problems in terms of the funding and uh, the ability to maintain the uh, facilities. Uh, today, as was indicated, uh, the um, uh, number of uh, new facilities and things coming online, including uh, med medical digital uh, uh, record, uh, is very important and will serve to uh, make the system uh, more efficient. Um, but at any rate, the uh, the hospitals have had uh, funding problems for years, and um, there were uh, many proposals over the years to uh, close, to downsize, to do a number of things which would have uh, ultimately uh, uh, destroyed the ability to provide care to uh, communities in need. And while we always opposed most of those things, it's uh, uh, good to see that we now feel that th there uh, is some serious uh, uh, concern about the uh, nature of the facilities and the programs. Um, a working group uh, convened by the state and uh, representative stakeholders uh, have evaluated several options, and our union endorses the uh, proposal known as the uh, H and H Community ICSP uh, uh, proposal, which would draw down uh, additional federal uh, matching funds through an enhanced Medicaid rate. Um, the hospitals with the um, large budget budgets and uh, attached to or quite often to prestigious medical schools um, have such extremely high rates that. Uh, we are concerned that uh, the, the intent may be to um, uh, minimize what a system like H&H &H does. So uh, we're encouraging uh, this council to work with us uh, in support of a proposal which will uh, help us to guarantee what is remaining of the um, uh, uh, federal monies especially as they apply to um, uh, what we call the, the uh, uh, indigent uh, uh, population. A uh, single payer system, it, there's been much discussion in the state and the country about a single payer system or uh, Medicaid, the Medicare rather for all uh, system. The uh, number one issue for Americans in the uh, midterm elections of uh, 2018 was indeed health and uh, health care. And um, while we heard from the administration in Washington that uh, they felt the imperative was to uh, reduce, eliminate, um, and destroy, uh, we feel that the uh, results of the elections were clear and that they stated that we need to do uh, more in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, health care. But we are concerned that some of the uh, proposals on the table will uh, go a long way to undermine some of the things we do. For example, uh, when we negotiate our contracts, the um, health is very much a part of that, and um, it's very important to us that we uh, maintain the economic viability of those uh, contracts and those services. Um, primary and specialty care. Our union is strongly in support of the proposal to invest $100 million in H&H &H in order to provide the critical primary care and specialty care to New Yorkers, regardless of their insurance or immigration status. We want our neighbors, our uh, fellow workers, and passengers on the subways and buses to be healthy. Some of us are fortunate to have private health insurance through our jobs, including the excellent plans available to city workers. However, more than uh, 600,000 New Yorkers and their families are still uninsured, and it's possible they are not uh, able to access insurance despite many uh, programs that exist. 
um, we uh, cannot leave these people out of the health care system if we do it create the weak link in the chain of a strong uh, city. Uh, with additional funding, more primary care doctors and health care providers will be uh, added to the system. Uh, more ambulatory care uh, clinics can be opened in uh, convenient locations with extended hours to meet the needs of the uh, patients. Um, and uh, three express care clinics, uh, Elmhurst, Lincoln, and Jacoby uh, in the Bronx, um, uh, have been uh, uh, implemented recently with extended hours and uh, the fact that their ability to absorb patients is uh, even greater. Um, with all of the expansion comes the additional need of clerical and clinical support staff. These are good jobs with benefits that provide additional stable employment in the community. Um, specialty care, well, you know what, I think what I'm going to do is to leave the remaining um, uh, items here for you to uh, read, but the uh, basis is that we believe that a strong, uh, viable H&H uh, system is indeed um, uh, a system that uh, has to be maintained. It is the uh, uh, system quite often of last resort for many families, and uh, if what we're hearing is correct coming out of Washington, then uh, ultimately it may indeed assume an even greater role going into the future. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Heidi Siegfried. I'm the Health Policy Director at Center for Independence of the Disabled in New York. And we, our goal is to ensure full integration and independence and equal opportunity for all people with disabilities by removing barriers to full participation in the community. So we help people um, with disabilities of all kinds understand and roll in their insurance and use it um, and in their, and get care, get access to the care that they need. Um, I, like we, we haven't heard any particular complaints and I don't have any expertise really about specialty care at H&H, &H, but this has been really interesting. I do, I have done a lot of work on network adequacy and um, held focus groups all around the state uh, and the, the appointment availability time issue is, is a big one. Um, so it was interesting to hear this new, new data. Um, in New York, uh, for, for network adequacy, we have a 30 minutes, 30 miles requirement. And then in Medicaid, we have um, appointment availability times, depending on the type of appointment that you need to get. So it's like 72 hours for one type of appointment and four weeks for another type of appointment. And uh, so these are all, um, you know, the Department of Health uh, maintains these, these standards for Medicaid, but when IPRO goes out to do a secret shopper audit of the Medicaid plans, they find that just about every, I think they do it every two years, and the most recent one that I saw, they all failed. So that meant that they were not able to meet those appointment availability times 75% of the time. So I'm really, I'm, I've been pushing at the state level with our state agenda to, um, to have appointment availability times for all types of coverage and, um, and to have some enforcement somehow, you know, <laughs> because that's really the problem. I mean, you know, they, so the Department of Health gets these reports. Do they do anything about it? You know, we don't really know because they're not the most transparent organization. But um, so I'll just say that I decided to focus my remarks more on access um, issues because that's really important. That is something that we work on at Sydney. And, um, People with disabilities tend to get overlooked because they're just sort of thought of as this small population that people don't think about. Like, you know, for example, they don't think about it when they put in a towel holder in a bathroom. Um, but so I just, I did put some data there about the percentage of New Yorkers that have different types of disabilities, visual, hearing. So we're not just talking about ambulatory disabilities, you know, cognitive, self-care and independent living. 
And the reason why it's important to have um, access to care, I mean, people with disabilities are a recognized health disparity population in the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, you know, the reason is because they often go without care because of the accessibility issue. Um, they're more likely not to have had a dental visit in two years, a mammogram in two years, a pap, oh, dental visit in a year, I think it was, annual, yeah, a pap test within three years. Um, and, and there is this, there is an interaction of factors that includes, um, you know, discrimination, accessibility, and accommodation. So it's not, it's not really just the physical accessibility. Um, it's also programmatic accessibility, because we often think, oh, well, let's just talk about ramps and adjustable tables and, and weight scales. Um, but also, it, it's um, accommodating people by um, giving them, you know, certain appointment times, like maybe if they're on some kind of mental health drug that they don't really function too well until later in the day, or, um, and, you know, not to have, to get additional help when they need it, um, filling out forms, if they have a cognitive problem, um, and then, of course, communication. American Sign Language needs to be available, um, and you know that kind of thing. Um, and I will say, this is another issue where, uh, in New York State, we don't um, we don't have uh, uh, any kind of we have like very lax rules about um, accessibility, even for the for the physical accessibility, um, because we allow self attestation. Uh, so the, the providers, they don't even know really what an ADA compliant facility is, but they think that they are. And um, so we, you know, we, don't real, we don't have a third party going out and testing it. And in California, they have, um, they have done this. Um, they've worked actually with Syracuse University, which is in New York State, and with um, DREDF, which is the Disability Rights and Education Defense Fund. And um, you know they've used a, a, a survey tool that has you know 86 items on it, and um, they have you know they have found some improvement. They've only they've only surveyed primary care offices, but um, just that in the, and it's still really low. But by by measure, you know whatever you measure, you get improvement in, right? And um, so they did go from uh, height adjustable exam tables went from 8.4% in 2010 to 19% in 2017, and adjustable um, and accessible weight scales went from 3.6% to 10.9%. So it's just, and we don't really, I, can, I don't have, it's interesting because we, we have this United States Access Board that develops standards for accessibility. And they went through um, developing the standards during the Obama administration of what an accessible um, exam table would be. So they're talking about, does it go to 17 inches? Does it go to 19 inches? I mean, they were having arguments about this type of thing. But um, then the next phase was supposed to be, well, what percentage of providers do you need to have that, that have accessible exam tables or, or diagnostic equipment? And that was when, of course, the new administration came in and, and shut, they shut down that next piece of work. So I can't really say you know, what is an acceptable um, amount of offices. But certainly, you know, w one in each borough is, isn't, you know, what we'd like to see. And it, it, we need to, we, it would be good to just really do a good survey and, and see what we have and try to improve it. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. I concur with my colleagues here, but I want to touch on some other factors related to specialty care. Um, and thank you, um, Councilman Carlina Rivera and Councilman Diana Arian. Um, we kind of know access to specialty care in New York City safety nets already strained. It's already facing increasing pressures with cuts to health care at all levels of government. And some of that, I will not go through it, but it obviously it goes to uh, the issue of a specialties gap down to underrepresentation of minorities, communities of color, immigrant communities, ethnic communities within those fields as well. Um, although uh, I agree with Dr. Cass that uh, there are a lot more diversity in terms of physicians and all that, and, and nurses and all, in the healthcare, in the hospital system in terms of the public hospitals. But we know that we have a unique landscape, right? We're the, we have the largest public hospital system 
in the nation. But we also have the most prominent academic medical centers in the nation. And that's caused a real two-tier system, uh, where about you see low-income patients who are publicly insured, Medicaid uninsured, underinsured, disproportionately receiving care in public system, while privately insured patients are overrepresented in the private hospitals. And really what basically it is that you see this varying inequitability also in specialty care. And part of it is, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, and it's also the cost of specialty care varies within hospitals um, and hospital networks. And so that's a big issue too. Um, but when you think about public hospitals, it's also community health centers and other um, true safety nets. They have assumed the responsibility for, for a greater proportion of the care of the uninsured and for marginalized communities. But we still need to be concerned that the capacity for these safety net providers, especially health and hospitals, to care for them is always in jeopardy, especially for specialty care or diagnostic testing. In addition, this is why we can't look at health and hospitals just in a vacuum. Um, the ability to provide specialty care must be looked from a comprehensive lens, particularly around the inequity and the segregated healthcare system in terms of how that's distributed and who has access. And, and private hospitals, to be frank, can't survive without the public hospitals um, accepting patients at all levels. Um, this reality determines, means that we really have to correct that inequity, and that's why I say about looking at specialty care from a, a much broader view. Um, in November uh, 2018, Health and Housing announced the expansion of the e-consult system. You know, it's a tool that makes easier for primary care providers and specialists to communicate with each other, helping the patient. Um, and sometime in 2019, we're going to have New York Cares, which begins to guarantee some more comprehensive health care for all residents, particularly specialty care, prescription drugs, mental health services, and hospitalization. But I would say to the City Council Hospital Committee and individual council members, where the public houses they're located in their districts to really closely monitor and get updates on these implementations. Uh, we support these efforts, but we also understand maintaining, sustaining capacity, including staff in the public house to fulfill its mission and provide to both residents and adjacent communities as well, um, continue to be a challenge. And we know that we still need to fix various areas that impact access to specialty care and other forms of medical care. Um, while I don't have all the data on health and hospitals delivery of specialty care, I do have stories and issues and concerns. Major issues for us is still waiting times, referral delays, um, the call center. Some of it is also what um, Anne had um, alluded to and said about. Um, and so, so the other concern is also, we know H&A efforts to ensure everyone is an important goal. They've done as well and, and they do well with it. But certain facilities, what I heard, has been a little bit coercive in steering away people if they don't fit in the pre-certified status of health insurance, steering them away from some HAC options. Um, I don't think that's across the board, but that really needs to be addressed, uh, particularly when we know that a lot of immigrants still fear, given the federal threats um, through public charge or through ICE being at courts or at, at front of hospitals, they still that fear still aligns. And so even when the person is publicly insurable, they may have a family that's not and that person may not choose to go on Medicaid or private health insurance because of that fear. Um, so I have some recommendations. I think the most obvious, and I think h, &H does well of it in times, and sometimes not always, but way better than the private, is to ensure that community-based organizations are directly involved um, in conducting outreach assessments and maximizing their efforts. Um, and I think we've done well in the past with h, &H but I want to improve on that and, and strengthen it. Um, Patient appointment and scheduling um, clinics progress. I think there needs to be a clear uniform definition of measuring access to specialty care. Um, there's a, other ones that I have here bulleted um, to form specialty care scheduling committee or something like that to governing body for guiding these things. I think it's also improving daily clinic communication to defining staff roles, creating standards of work for all staff with the staff as well. Um, I have a whole bunch of other ones here. Uh, I also think it's optimizing e clinics work training better with staff. But in the end, it's also ensuring safe staffing around specialty care and all types of clinical care. And the city council, I think, really should send a letter of support around the safe staffing legislation with NISNA that has been spearheading it. I think it's important to do that. There's no point of having all this specialty and clinical care and you don't have enough staff to take care of you. That's a, not a safety issue not for the nurses, but it's also a patient quality care issue. Um, I think you have to continue engaging frontline staff in improvement 
um, you know, do daily performance improvement huddles or something like that, institute countermeasures to improve specialty and procedure and surgical wait times, monitor weekly wait times as well. Um, and so to me, the current fiscal environment has significantly and negatively has never had consequences to terms of delivery timely and high quality specialty care, providing a positive patient experience, maintaining financial sustainability, and satisfying regulatory standards. We want to ensure HANH succeeds in their efforts to improve access and quality of specialty care, but it, we know that there are challenges and we really need to address them, but it's also not addressing h, &H just on its own. We have to look at this entire healthcare system in terms of access to care, particularly for the most marginalized communities. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a couple questions, if that's okay. Um, so let me start with the EAT consult. I know, um, Anthony, you mentioned in your testimony. Does anyone here have experience with H and H's EAT consult system? Not personally, my, but uh, my mother has. Mm. <laughs> so, um, and it varies depending. You know, uh, CAS is right. It's a tool, right? It's not the end all. So it cannot replace the, the, all the patient and, and doctor relationship or and things like that. Um, sometimes it works for my mom, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I never really got full details, um, but once or twice when she goes to Bellevue, she feels it's worked for her, and then other times she's literally had decided not to come back because of some situation. Um, but my mom is that same person that's living through a very hard condition, has lupus. Um, and many other factors going on and lives in public housing, as you know, and all these things play a role. And so that causes her not to also go to appointments. And so that's a clear thing. That's why you have to do some gap assessments and really do that with community-based organizations. And, and it's not just acad academics doing it, because I've noticed some of these surveys don't, are not really culturally competent, don't really connect to communities. That's what the CBOs are for. We're the trusted brokers for that. But also with e-consults, it's a, it's a phone exchange between physician to physician. So, or whoever the specialist is, could be an NP, I don't know, whatever. But, um, but the point being is, is that there's no visualization of the patient on the part of the other individual. So it's not a be all and the end all, and the person most likely would still need another consult. It would be like to treat the urgent situation and hopefully that individual would then get an appointment with that actual specialist. I also wanted to bring up a, cu a couple of things that I forgot to mention. One of the issues is, is that New York City employees, all the insurances available to New York City employees should also be accepted by H&H. &H, and that's not always the case. Um, for, for example, I used to, I had, still have GHI, but for a long time, GHI was not accepted by health and hospitals, so, you know, I would pay a supplement when I would, you know, get care that I needed. And the other thing is, is the cancer, the idea is the uh, treatment is important, but the more important issue is screening. And what kind of outreaches are we making to the community to get people screened for cancer? Because yes, when the person comes in, they're gonna, they'll get as best care as possible for the stage that they're in but you don't want to see them in their later stages. You want to see them early on in order for obvious reasons. And what I always felt that there's an issue is, is that we don't have a catalog of services and we don't really go out there and toot our own horn, so to speak. You know, I, I live in Sunnyside, Woodside, so I see the stuff um, Falmhurst. I mean, I grew up at Bellevue, so that's where I go. But you know, the idea is, is I do see some advertisements, but not to the level that you know, you would expect in terms of that community. So, and also to know how to navigate the system and to see what services are readily available. When I alluded and I talked about segregated care, there's also this issue that there's a perception that our public hospitals don't provide high quality care, especially around specialty care. Hmm. Um, and that's part of what the private hospitals get um, bank on as well. And I think that in the perception has changed over time, but that still gets played out uh, in many ways. Have, have any of you received feedback in terms of people who actually want to access the specialty care? So we know as, as individuals that there is phenomenal care provided at H&H. &H. 
But however, maybe not anyone has, not everyone necessarily knows that. So for those who have entered an H and H system, have you had the conversation as to how their access was was like, what their experience was, and specifically, I wanted to ask um, for any clients you know that have physical limitations, their experiences in being in an H and H facility that was ADA compliant in a real way. I know you mentioned in your testimony, um, Ms. Siegfried, that you, don't ha you haven't received any particular complaints, but I think that your, your other recommendation as to an actual survey as like the one they did in California is, is really, really interesting. And so is that just based on the conversations you've had with some of the people at Sydney and just conversations? Well, I, I, um, I asked my executive director if, you know, if there was a way to try to find, uh, you know, what our Sydney consumers are experiencing. I mean, I probably could ask staff, I mean, I don't think there's probably going to be a way to do a query of our consumer records to find anything on this. But um, I could probably do more work to ask staff if they have any complaints from yeah, if it's, if it's you know what their experience has been using an H and H facility and and getting care if they have a disability. Yeah, I could I could see if I can get some stories. Yeah, and and of course if it's appropriate, and I and I only think because I, I know that the people at H and H and and mind you all of them are still here listening. Um, I think they'd welcome that sort of constructive feedback to see how they can improve. I, I would concur. I think Cass knows for the time he's been here. He's had a lot of CBOs come together and have conversations with him. I think what we need to do a little bit better is get that same information to the council in some ways, in terms of stories and all that. I can only give you my mom's situation, you know, um, which has gotten better over time, but, you know, she will miss an appointment and, at, and many times it will be uh, nine months before she gets her next lupus appointment. Um, now she's in, because of her age, uh, it allows her lupus not to be as, as, as strong in her, her system as others if she was younger, but just from a clinical standpoint. But, it, you know, that kind of feeling makes her not want to come the next time again because she said, why am I going to wait nine months again? Um, or she'll go in to get the clinic and get her appointments for her heart and everything else, and they'll, they'll say, well, you have to come back to get the appointment. Like I, and I don't think that's across the board. But if that's one person, I can guarantee you that the CBOs that we work with have plenty of other ones that, are, that have these issues and concerns. And thank you for, of course, sharing the experience of your mom. And, and I know Council Member Ayala shared the experience with her dad, which I think brought up a good point about Bellevue and being kind of this epicenter and some of the things that they should provide. So, and I know that when it comes to members at DC 37, I mean, 18,000 you know, sets of eyeballs on a situation or experiences in the facilities, you know, we welcome also the employee experience as to what they're seeing because, you know, you're the ones on the ground. So the council definitely wants to be helpful. Sometimes we are kind of stuck in city hall. And so we certainly welcome those stories and, and uh, we could relay that. Clearly, you all have the relationship to relay it to H and H, but sometimes it helps when when it comes from someone who's representing those particular facilities. I, I have friends that are in the World Trade Center clinic as patients, and the issue was it, they are very satisfied with the care, but the issue was getting into the clinic, mm. into the system, and accessing it, and. Um, you know, they, they needed some help in terms of navigation in order, in order to get into the clinic. So I think it's, it's like once people are in the system, generally speaking, they're very satisfied with the quality of the providers, but it's the idea of being able to navigate and being able to work through it and to understand the process of that navigation. And like I said, I really don't think, you know, I'm tired of seeing those Columbia Presbyterian advertisements on TV because mm -hmm. You know, I can tell you 10 stories in my lifetime that I've seen it, you know, for every one they talk about. So I really don't think we, you know, uh, the system as itself toots its own horn in terms of what its capabilities are. And, and, and that's, you know, basically what I want, you know. But I really think it has to do with the process in terms of the assistance, in terms of getting into the clinics, the registration, the access for appointment, et cetera, et cetera and to know how to do that. Right, and I, and I try to um, 
focus a good amount of time on uh, appointments and the wait times and the new system and because I think that's just so important once you get there. There's also, there's also clinics that kind of like dovetail each other, like your asthma clinic and your GI clinic in terms of, you know, GERD and all that. I mean, they're interrelated so that you need to have those kind of clinics working together with each other and available so that you're not jumping from one area to, from one hospital to another or what have you. And I think that also working in concert with regards to those things is also quite important as well. And during my time with H&H &H and even afterwards, I was very much aware that um, each facility had uh, what they called a community advisory board. And what happened too often was the board spent an inordinate amount of time complaining. Now, not to say that there weren't things to complain about, but when we talk about the image that's presented of the uh, uh, voluntaries or privates, whatever they call themselves, um, if they do it through advertisements and we have our members and our community in the hospital and uh, there are thousands and thousands of transactions every day that um, uh, result in a satisfactory conclusion, we have to find a way to harvest those and get them out to the uh, public and especially those who use the hospitals. I had occasion to use Bellevue on, um, uh, for a pretty serious matter. I went there, um, the uh, uh, physician in charge of the emergency room uh, facilitated uh, my entry, uh, didn't know who I was, and uh, before I knew it, I had a, a, a satisfactory conclusion. I wrote a letter to, uh, express that. Um, you know, I'm not sure that many people would do that, but at the same time, there must be a way to get people to attest to the fact that these institutions are not um, uh, what I, I hear people alluding to from time to time. I'm spending a lot of time defending and saying this is uh, not the place that I know of. No, I, I think that's fair, and, and when you mentioned the CABs, the community advisory boards, I do think that we could all still do a little bit of work on how to empower them in a different way, because that, that board is only as productive as the resources the individual members have, and so I know some of them had some issues even filling the vacancies, and I think that was because of a level of frustration in certain facilities with leadership at the time, and this was years ago when I was a member of the CAB, of the Bellevue CAB. Uh, and a Anthony, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, CPHS did a lot of trainings to the community advisory boards. One, to understand the charter, understand everything that was going through it. I think there's, a, I agree with you in terms of resources and thinking that through. But also, um, the opportunity that we have is that we still have uh, facilities and, and, and leadership, not per se maybe in the central office, but still across the board in different levels, who still act like their own chiefdom. They do not act like a network. <laughs> And I know that Cass and others have tried hard to change that behavior, but it's still there, and it's a work in progress, but that's still happening. And, and so, you know, when they, when h, &H branded themselves as h, &H mm, it was part of that issue. Mm. And, I, and then I'll give you what is really important. I mean, I work closely with North Central Bronx and the, the whole community over there. Th there are real successes in what was said by uh, Gray about getting out to the community, letting them know what type of service they have, and increasing that ability to do that and getting support for it. Um, the question is, how does that translate to the other facilities? How does leadership in those facilities talk to the other facilities and tell them these are the successes and these are the challenges? That needs to be more uniform or figure out a better way to do it. And I think it includes community-based organizations as well in that kind of process. Well, that's, uh, thank you. We are, I am still hoping, um, to, to have hearings in some of the facilities, specifically I think on issues that are particularly important in those areas, whether it's the neighborhood or whether it's the facility, something that they do really well to give H&H &H an opportunity to, you know, compliment themselves, we'll ask them some questions, but also to give them the credit that they deserve. So and I wanna thank you all uh, for your testimony today and for all the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank see any more members of the public that wish to testify and with that I adjourn this hearing thank you